Anyone who's been personally touched by serious illness knows the struggle of navigating the healthcare industry. From waiting for an appointment, to miscommunications between doctors and nurses, to unmanageable bills, it's often a frustrating and stressful process. But it doesn't have to be this way. Unmesh Srivastava is reimagining what healthcare can be. He's the chief technology officer of P3 Health Partners, a company led by physicians who want to change the way patient care is delivered. They do it by empowering patients with tools and resources to manage their own wellness, offering on-demand concierge care, and working to reduce the cost of services for all. Today, we're talking with Unmesh about how data can be used to predict medical issues, remote patient monitoring, value-based care, and his personal reason for going into medical tech. So without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to Truth Be Known. Welcome to another episode of Truth Be Known. I am so, so excited to have a special guest today, Unmesh from P3 Health Partners. Um, I've known Unmesh for about a year. He is one of the most interesting, innovative CTOs of pretty much that I've ever met and very, very much in the the healthcare space. So thank you so much for coming in and for joining the call. And I'd love for you to tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the kind introductions there, Lauren. So as you said, uh, my name is Unmesh Srivastava. And I'm uh, the chief technology officer for P3 Health Partners. And my job is to pretty much manage everything tech and digital at P3, where we are building the next generation care delivery organization in population health management. We serve four markets at this time, around 85,000 patients or lives that we impact through our clinicians and through our data-enabled and tech-enabled uh, care delivery ecosystem. Looking forward to talking to you today. There are so many things I want to talk to you about. Before I I get into all of the great things you've done at P3 Health Partners. How did you get started in health tech? (laughs) It's a very interesting story. I got started in health tech before I actually knew it was health tech. My mother is a doctor and, you know, I was in India doing my undergrad in the city called Jaipur. And uh, the college, my engineering school was in this remote area where You know, I saw a lot of unprivileged people and, you know, folks, we didn't have a healthcare sort of primary care in that area. And uh, what me and some of the other friends decided was to do a couple of health camps and sort of have my mom free up her time on a Saturday afternoon where we could do a Google Hangout call and just set up like a camp in one of the neighboring sort of small town villages and to just do some clinical advice if someone needs that. And that's how it started. And, you know, to me, it was sort of a social giving back. But I realized that just having this face-to-face, the ability to talk remotely, this was in 2006, 2007, it's so powerful. And that's what led to sort of me getting into health tech. And then I came to U.S. for higher studies and started working in a lot of these cutting edge healthcare delivery organizations where just it just flew off. I didn't plan to go into medicine, but half of my family is of doctors. So I was like, I'm going to avoid this. But your destiny takes you to places. So here I am on the other side of the fence in, in tech. No, I, I love that. It's the... I rebelled against my parents by not becoming a doctor, but what I'm really doing is helping deliver patient better, like better patient care for everybody. So it's the the slight rebellion, right? Slight rebellion. Only that far I could go was on the tech side of healthcare, but still stayed in healthcare. That's awesome. And then um, from the the things I know about P3, it just sounds so similar to the things that you talked about, and it's the tell me if I get this right about P3, but it's this mission to change the way healthcare is delivered. I remember reading that P3 believes that together as physicians, we can heal the heal the system, restore purpose, and infuse care and health into healthcare. And so much of that sounds like what you're talking about, that it is this really patient-centric approach in changing the way patient care is delivered. 
Exactly. No, you're spot on there, Lauren, because P3 was started by two physicians, Dr. Amir Bakas and Dr. Sharif Abdul. And the mission was really to bring very physician-centric care in healthcare, because a lot of healthcare is driven by administrators and not clinicians and physicians. And a lot of times, administrators will not really understand what patients need, unless you touch and feel and you understand what the need at a human level is, you can't run a healthcare entity. And that's why P3 was born. And all of us in P3, whether it be our operations, our clinical, our tech teams are all working towards that mission of empowering our clinicians to provide the best patient-facing you know, care. That's awesome. So tell me, what have you been working on recently at P3? There's so much going on, but I I can probably touch on some of the high points. We've been in business three and a half years since we started, you know, getting into care delivery. And our first couple of years was really about building sort of the back end bedrock layer or the infrastructure to innovate upon. And now we are in that phase where we are a fast growing organization and we are doing a lot of innovation to really transform here. So some of the big uh, initiatives in the product uh, innovation world that we are leading to right now is we are implementing sort of expanding upon our wearables technology and IoT and IOMT space. And we are broadening our reach to congestive heart failure patients to chronic kidney disease patients, COPD, diabetes, and we are growing that area where we are connected to all these patients who are in remote settings and we are continuously capturing the data from these wearable devices and feeding it into our centralized sort of nurse hub to drive a lot of clinical interventions driven by the data as and when required. So we are taking a strong, bold step moving towards a remote patient monitoring. We are also close to getting started with a similar exercise in social determinants of health space. So people who are lonely or do not have a you know support system around them, we are looking to implement remote tools in order to support them and then also enable them with social workers and just people who can talk to them when they need someone to talk to. So that's one big area. We are also moving forward very quickly in AI and machine learning, where now we are building machine learning models and we are moving from business intelligence to artificial intelligence when it comes to identifying patients who are rising risk and may turn into a high risk in next couple of months or years, uh, unless they are we provide the right clinical care and engage them in their care. We are doing a lot of work in um, the machine learning space where you know a lot of our clinicians are doing suspect generation where they are helping our doctors to just give them a, a 360 view of patients. So we are embedding a lot of personalized patient-centric data points in there, which we are moving into machine learning. So it's getting into more predictive modeling as compared to more human, humanly done by clinicians. Uh, I think that some of the initiatives, we have quite a bit of stuff going on in healthcare learning with patients, providers. So lots going on, but these are some of the high points. That's so cool. And it's uh, so between wearables and it sounds like proactive outreach. I would love to, oh, there's so many things I want to learn about with you. With what you're doing with, understanding people that are medium risk to getting to high risk and pulling in some of that data. How are you, how are you using that to be able to keep people from becoming high risk and really improve quality of life? Sure. No, that's a great question, Lauren. And it starts with data. So we are pulling data from all these places, from hospitals, HIEs, health plans, PCP offices, specialists, pharmacies, labs, and we are bringing, centralizing that. And then we are running dynamic risk stratification algorithms that tell us who is a rising risk, who is a high risk. And then our care management model is built for these different risk stratums that we've calculated in our risk algorithm. A rising risk is someone, depending on, you know, if they're a diabetic who might turn into a CKD, 
if they don't control their HbA1cs, then we enroll them into care management program on diabetes management. If there are people who have not had a doctor visit in last two years or one year or a elongated time period and they are not engaged in their care journey, we make sure we arrange transportation lift to get them to their doctor office, or we dispatch a home health care worker to their home and run a telehealth visit with a clinician who's sitting there. So there are multiple modalities in our care model that we've defined and designed to engage patients in their care, in a more proactive care ecosystem. And uh, it's built by risk types and how you align care delivery to those risk types. That's so cool. And it's the, you're able to improve quality of life for people, you're able to not just improve life, but it sounds like in so many ways, keep people alive and from getting from your high risk to you have a severe problem that now needs to be dealt with in a much more dramatic fashion. Exactly. At least that's what we are shooting for. It's pretty incredible. And the, I can only imagine for sort of the cost of healthcare, preventative medicine reduces cost to healthcare, increases the longevity of all of us. Exactly. We are spending, U.S. is spending a lot of money in healthcare costs. 18% of our GDP is spent on healthcare, $3.4 trillion. So crazy. So we have to do this. It's completely insane. And um, it's funny, I listened to a, a podcast you did recently in This Week in Health Tech, and you mentioned that other countries are doing healthcare better, and they're starting to disrupt the U.S. healthcare industry. Can you tell me a little more about that? Absolutely. I mean, if you really see inherently, we, you know, the first part of it is what problem are we going through? U.S. healthcare spending is the top in the world. It's 18% of the GDP as of 2020, which is $3.4 trillion. The life expectancy in U.S. is uh, lower than some of the other countries. The chronic comorbidities are high. And clearly, this huge healthcare spend is not going anywhere. And I think inherently, one of the things that we have to think about here is why is it so expensive? We've just overcomplicated the U.S. healthcare system in multiple ways. You know, we have so many systems within healthcare. So there's healthcare within healthcare that has created so much waste. There's Medicare, there's Medicaid, there's fee-for-service, there are these different deductible plans from different insurance companies, there's HMOs, PPOs, co-pays and co-insurance. It, it just has built like a very fragmented system within the system, which causes a lot of this, lot of this haywalk. Our drug costs, they are really high. It's controlled completely privately. Government, you know, has the kind of jurisdiction that other countries have. And that's appalling. And drug costs are going up the roof. Our hospitals are like profit centers. So they are not, they are not paid by healthcare outcomes. They are really paid by the number of admissions and discharges they do and the length of stay. And that's how they get billed by these private insurance companies. We practice defensive medicine. There's, uh, I've seen talking to physicians at the ground level, they have to buy so many insurances to make sure that it keeps them safe. And all of this contributes towards healthcare costs. Even in, like, if you would have seen in COVID-19, prices of care delivery vary from setting to setting. If you go to an urgent care versus a hospital ER versus a primary care, for the same kind of treatment, you'll be charged anywhere from $180, $90 to $3,000 if you end up in a hospital. For the same care, you'll be provided. So all of these things create a lot of waste. And hence, you see a lot of medical tourism happening these days in dental space, in outpatient surgery. People are going to, some people are going to other developed countries like, you know, Japan. Some people are going to Middle East. We have all these different countries, Malaysia, their, their system is great. And they've managed to remove all of this sort of cost bearing stuff in healthcare. And that's driving a lot of this medical tourism. And I think we need to uncluster a lot of that in U.S. We need to have government play a more important role in U.S. healthcare, and there has to be more governance around the prices and stuff like that. And I hope that's going to bring the healthcare costs down. But so far, it's not worked, and that's what us healthcare workers and techies are working towards to bring it down. 
That's awesome. And then how do you think using things like data can help reduce some of the costs of healthcare? No, that's a great question, Lauren. And I think data is the centerpiece of how you can actually change stuff. A lot of the payment model in US, the pay you the way you pay for care delivery is done in a fee for service model, which means that every time you go to a care delivery setting, the doctor gets paid or the hospital gets paid or the pharmacy gets paid. That is very quickly, and that's what we call volume based care or fee for service. That's moving very fast towards value-based care, which is outcome-driven care. I would like to see all these quality parameters of Lauren's health. How many times has she been to ER in last six months to one year? What are the quality ratings? Has she done all her screenings? What is her patient satisfaction scores? What was her experience in these provider settings? And that should lead to payment to these care delivery settings. And that's what P3 is doing. We guys are in population health management. So all of the payment models that we work on with the contracts, with the plans we work with, is really in value-based care. And I think there is no other way than having slick data in your ecosystem that can drive that. Because now you need to touch all these data points to identify physician performance, patient satisfaction, to identify the quality of care, the cost of care. And if that's how you're going to pay the healthcare system and give them all the perks of providing great care, then it has to be data driven. There's no other way. And also preventive healthcare cannot be done without data. You have to have data to engage people in preventive care. Otherwise, how are you going to know that there are millions of people out of those million people, which of the populations need what type of care? And uh, I think data is the centerpiece of all of that data and analytics. I couldn't agree with you more. And if, and there are so many studies and data points around, if we just found things out a little bit sooner, and if you just know things sooner, whether it's cancer prevention or diabetes or really anything, the sooner you know, the earlier you detect, the better it is. And I, you'd mentioned wearables earlier. Are we able to start tying in things like your wearable data to some of your healthcare records? As an example, how active somebody is and how does that relate to their current health conditions, whether we can improve them or if they're worsening? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's the aspiration towards what we are working on. And I think talent has played a big role there. All of the stuff that we've done, currently all of our wearable data that we receive, we tie back that same data points, the continuous data ingestion that we have back to what you call a global master patient index. We identify who Lauren is and then Lauren's data coming from all these sources, not just wearables, pacemaker, you know, if you have a pacemaker, internet of things, internet of medical things, and the last time you went to a hospital, what was your diagnosis? What was your discharge summary? You went to urgent care, what was your diagnosis there? What kind of labs were you asked to do? The lab, when you went to a lab, what were your readings, your order, your results? If you went to a pharmacy to get prescription drugs, what were those prescription drugs? You went to your PCP office, your last three years' worth of data. If you've been with United Healthcare, and prior to that, you've been with Blue Cross Blue Shield and Anthem and whichever health plans you work with, getting your historical data and then combining that into a singular longitudinal view and then doing something about it. I think that the number one job that we have as technologists is to get all of that data together and then convert that into meaningful information that we present to our clinicians for them to drive action. And not only clinicians, to your family members, to you, to your clinicians, if you're a diabetic and you're part of a diabetes management program, to your caregiver, your your uh, nurse care manager, we give data to all these people in the ecosystem. So collectively, the folks surrounding you, your caregivers, your family, you know, your clinician, your physician, they can all be in this care journey with you. And that's really our goal. That's what we want to drive at large population level. That's incredible. And it's this idea of we can make better decisions together. We can make, we can drive better outcomes together. And it is insane how in the United States, 
you go to two doctors and they, they don't have any idea that I went to get a physical and then I went to, I don't know, the ENT for something and that these two things might be related and that every time you have to do a new patient intake form. And it is still insane that in most places you are doing the same questions, answering the same things. And did I remember to say I take vitamins over here? That probably doesn't make a difference, right? And it's the most doctors are honestly operating on completely incomplete data sets um, and is relying on me to remember at that moment, I do, I, do, I, do I do this? this? Does this count? Yeah, and that's exactly right. And a lot of times you just go out of the healthcare world and you see other examples in other industries, how they've done it so well. If you go in financial industry and in banking, you go sit in front of a clerk who's sitting in some remote branch somewhere in a remote place, will run your credit score and will get a credit report and will give you last 20 years worth of your credit history, which financial institutions you went to, what kind of loan did you take, what kind of overall score do you have, where were you, where you couldn't make payments on time. So that whole credit history is available on click of a button. And I think healthcare has to be that. Like we have to take healthcare to that level where it's interoperable and you have standard records that everyone can get in click of a button. And that's where this, we can make so many good healthcare decisions or it will not be fragmented in a way it is today if we make this so seamless like what financial industry has done. It is, it's funny. It is, everything is connected when it's your money, but everything's not connected when it is your body and your life and your actual longevity on this planet and your enjoyment of the years that you have. And it's appalling. Uh, it should be the other way around. It Completely. Why do you think it's taken so long for for healthcare to come on this journey? I think there's a myriad of reasons around that. First and foremost, healthcare is one of those industries which it's so regulated and regulatory driven that if a lot of these technology problems or process problems are problems because it just takes really long to solve them because you now need to take care of Serbian Oxley. You have to take care of HIPAA, high trust. You have to take care of SOC2 type process requirements that drives a lot of this innovation and it slows down a lot of this innovation. But I think that it is changing for good. I think healthcare, I mean, there are the negatives of it, but the positive of the world changing around us with Amazons and Ubers and Microsofts and Googles, you know, being at the helm of things and, and transforming our day-to-day -day life experiences, I think it's changing. I don't know if you've seen, I just get appalled by seeing that whole medical ID feature within Apple Health that they've implemented where Apple is now pulling data from all the big care delivery systems, hospitals, pharmacies, labs, and you can have your own medical ID on Apple Health and you can just see all that data. I think data is like hands down the biggest thing that's going to drive any kind of transformation. And I think we are getting there. Still a lot of catching up to do, but I'm very hopeful that as we as techies and care delivery and all these people within the healthcare ecosystem are moving towards that direction very fast, especially in the last five to 10 years, the move has been quick. Play the futurist. What do you think the biggest changes we're going to see in healthcare in the next five to 10 years? I think there's going to be a lot of changes in next 10 years. I think some of the points are behavioral and mental health is no longer going to be sidelined. There was a stigma around it, which is going to go away and it's going to be at the center of healthcare. Behavioral and mental health are real problems, which need to be dealt with even more rigor as compared to clinical. So they are going to be central. Healthcare will become very personalized. If you go on Amazon or the sites where you are connected, the system knows what's your preference in terms of your buying, you know, what you like to buy. And it accordingly tees up to your experience. I think healthcare is going to be very similar. It's going to be 
moving towards more virtual and concierge and individualized as compared to one size fits all that that it is today and especially with the with covid-19 coming into picture this virtual and concierge is really what is happening today and it's becoming mainstream every day i think iot and iomt will be centralized a lot of these biometrics and there will be a time when we will have 24/7 view of getting our vitals and biometrics fed into some kind of data environment and and it'll be completely preventive as compared to reactive that it is today i think ai and robotics will play a central role they will not replace clinicians we don't have enough clinicians physicians in our country or around the world i think ai and robotics are going to play a big role in empowering and enabling our clinicians to be that support layer for them to making clinical decisions and and then i i also think genomics is going to take a very central place in next 10 years i think your genes will really drive how your life decisions are going to be and what kind of uh, lifestyle you grow up with so you don't end up having genetic diseases or even lifestyle disease i think if you have strong genome genomics and you see that data it sort of is also mental where you start going into more preventive lifestyle as compared to just going the other way around so i think these are some of the changes that at least i see happening they're already set in motion and i think they're only going to get grow from here that is really exciting i was recommended a book today called how not to die which is I'm going to completely misrepresent this book since it was recommended to me a couple of hours ago, but it's the idea of the types of foods we eat and the lifestyle we live starts to elongate life. And the analogy I used with the the colleague of mine that I was speaking with is he's got a very nice car, takes care of his car really well. And it was you're not going to put cheap gas in your very fancy BMW. You're going to put good gas, you're going to provide regular maintenance for this car because you spent all of this money on this car. If you put cheap gas in and if you don't change the oil, it's going to fall apart. The gas is like, why do we eat too many Doritos? And I know once in a while, it's fine and live your life. But we have to also treat the, the types of foods that we eat, the lifestyle that we live, how active we are, is going to have that direct correlation to how we feel our overall health. And I love what you're saying is, if we can start building this out more and more, we get more data and information and we should not tell people what to do. We should give people the information and the data to make choices and decisions. And it's almost like when they started putting uh, calories on menus, sometimes, you know what, you want the burger and fries and you know it's got 1800 calories for that burger and fries. But they also have another option that you might like just as much that 600 calories. Sometimes you want one option. Sometimes you went, you know what? I want a burger and fries and I don't care that it's bad for me. To be able to give people that data of this is how your genetics play a role in what you're doing. Here's things that you could be more or less susceptible to. This is how your lifestyle is going to play a role. This is how how active you are. This is what we're learning from doctor's visits. And to give people that information, that data, that power to make decisions, we will choose to do what we will choose to do. But wouldn't it be great to know if you walk 5,000 steps more a day, that is going to help counteract this condition you didn't even know you were predisposed to. You want to walk the 5,000 extra steps? That is still your choice to do. But it would be great to know if you do those things, it can be preventative. And I love what you're saying on where we're starting to go and how we can really start to get smarter and better at this. And I want to extend this part of my life where I am healthy and doing well and active and my whole body doesn't hurt. Teach us how to do this. And if the healthcare industry can teach us how to do this that becomes a really incredible future. Yeah, no, everything you said is so spot on. The world is moving in that direction. Food is fuel. Allopathy is reactive medicine. Ayurveda and some of these herbal alternatives are becoming mainstream. Preventive lifestyle changes. A lot of these chronic conditions are lifestyle diseases. And I think data changes behavior. If you have the right data, 
to see what might play out in future. If you don't take actions now, you'll definitely change those actions to change that future that will come. And a lot of times we don't see that future and that's why we don't change our actions today. And I think data is the only way that you can do that. Absolutely. It's a future unmeshes problem. He'll deal with it later, but one day (laughs) later will come. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So one of the things that I love to get into people's heads a little bit about is this whole idea of decision making. How we make decisions is fascinating. I would love to learn from you. What is the what's the hardest decision you've had to make? I've had a couple of hard decisions in life that I've I had to make. I think in the earlier phases of my life, the whole idea of leaving a place where you were born and raised to go to a completely different culture and a country and start a life there again was a big decision. I was really scared, but I made that decision. I had to, along with the family, make end-of-life care decisions for my father. That was really tough. And I think so far, if I go and flashback, those have been two biggest decisions that I've made in my life. And yeah so far. So you did an interview with Tago Mag. I read that you described your father's illness as a trigger for you. What did you mean by that? And how did it shape your mindset? So my father was diagnosed with uh, stage four gallbladder cancer. And in eight months, he passed away. I still remember it was July of 2017. I was planning to see him and family in India in August. And all of a sudden, we came to know that, hey, there's this diagnosis. I closed down everything in the U.S., took a sabbatical, went to India. I was with him for those eight months as his caregiver, hospital, home. I thought I knew about healthcare up until that point because I had worked with United Health Group, Optum, Kaiser, all these different like large healthcare entities. But at the ground, I think it was so hard to navigate the healthcare system in those eight months. I think that experience just changed my life because you're going through it. You you know, there are so many lessons I learned in those life lessons, career lessons, a lot of different things, right? I think navigating the healthcare system is hard, period. Which country you are in doesn't really matter. I think that was a big challenge. The need of concierge care, having someone 24-7, because as a primary caregiver, a lot of times where you're like, okay, my dad is not eating well, what should I do? Or he's having pain, what pain meds? So having someone 24-7 to talk to a clinician and that whole idea of concierge have care when you need it as compared to taking appointments and going to the care facility, I think that was super critical. Importance of data. I didn't know I was looking for clinical trials happening around the world where if there's even a slightest of opportunity that I can engage him, that whole data on clinical trials, data on his overall health. Cost of drugs, they are so expensive. I mean, leave aside immunotherapy is like north of $200,000, which for some of these developing countries is not, if you're paying out of pocket, it's it's not possible. Even in US, $200,000, $300,000, who can afford that? Even chemotherapy drugs are very expensive. So cost of drugs, I think empathy towards the patient and the family members who are going through that, but also empathy towards the physicians and clinicians. I mean, I was seeing the doctors and nurses in the hospital. We would stay there for three weeks, a month, or whatever it took. Every time there was an episode of he had to get admitted, and I was seeing the nurses work 12-hour shifts and completely burnt out. I used to see the the doctors who were just didn't have time. They would be called back into ER at one, two in the night where they just left their shifts at 10. So there was all these things that transpired in that and then making those end of life decisions. What would you different do differently? Will you actually go through chemo if you know that there is no other way out? And do you actually prefer making that 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 decision of going through medications and chemo or do you just you know go back and say okay let's uh, just stay together and spend time so all of these things i think made me just ponder what i'm doing in healthcare and 
made me just remove all that burden and make life and career decisions which are very different than how I used to before that. So I think it was a big life-changing event. I practice that every day in my life, even today. Whenever there's like things that come in, I heard, I learned a word recently called FOMO, fear of missing out. A lot of people in corporate go through that. And every time I'm going through those cycles, I go back to that experience and I say, what is important? I think there's, we all forget we are here for a finite time period and you have to, you know, you have to have a mission that's bigger than you and bigger than financial and other things. So it's definitely shaped a lot of things in my life. First of all, I'm so sorry about your father. It sounds like a really trying experience, but, and there's so many things to learn from it and to take away. And it sounds like from everything you've talked about and we've discussed in the last 40 40 minutes or so, it really shows how all of those lessons feed into everything you do professionally. And it's this leading with empathy and really putting what can we do for people to lead better lives and everyone could go to work and just do their jobs because it's a job. You're a CTO, you can go in, you could just think about the technology side or you're thinking about the mission and how to improve people's lives. And when you do your job exceptionally well, this has such a meaningful impact on the world. Yeah. And it's the choices I I personally feel as a technologist, you have a lot of avenues to grow your career. Health healthcare is not for the weak hearted. I think there has to be a mission attached to it. And a lot of times these missions come because of some of these life events and just got to take it from there. Absolutely. And it is, I think the world is probably a better place with you focused on healthcare versus focused on somewhere else. And you are a hundred percent right. We get one life to live and knowing your, your purpose and what you want to do and get out of it is so incredibly important. I can talk to you all day about this and dig in more and all of the great work that you're doing completely transforming not just healthcare, but how patients and providers get a chance to live our lives and operate every day. But I think our producer would tell me to, I think I'd get the hook if there was a virtual hook (laughs) at some point. (laughs) So if you want to wrap up with a couple of quick decision questions. Absolutely. Let's do it. So what is your favorite quote? or saying one thing that i've stood by is try and try until you succeed stood by me all my life i love that i don't know if i want to ask you this question because i don't think i want this as an option if you weren't in health tech what would you be doing but i don't think i want you not in health tech (laughs) i would still be in healthcare, mostly on the care delivery side you know being a doctor or you know i would have probably been a civil servant in some capacity working on social causes okay okay i think if you had to not be in health tech i think those are okay options what is one talent or skill that's not on your resume i think you said it before um empathetic leadership i bring a lot of empathy in the decisions and leadership that i follow and that's something that's not on my resume what piece of advice would you give yourself 10 years ago Great question. I think if 10 years ago, I how to control your mind, I, I think the biggest challenge that you face in your life is your mind and your mindset. So master your mind. The, the time you learn to master your mind, I think everything else will fall in place. A lot of times you think about things that are important are really not, and it's all in your head. So manage that and you'll be just fine. I love that. Do you have any books, podcasts, apps, tips to help people better manage our minds? I think a couple of things. So I've been reading this book called or having listening to an audio book for Hit Refresh by Satya Nadella. I really recommend folks who are trying to drive transformation in their organizations to read it or listen to it. One piece of advice that at least I follow is that this world that we are living in today, you are not focused on stuff. So 
listen to a lot of like short audio books or go to YouTube if you don't like reading, but keep educating yourself. No one can take knowledge of it. Your money can be gone one day and other things will all be gone materialistic. But I think if you keep feeding your mind with the knowledge in whatever way you can consume it, keep doing that because you're only going to get better on a day by day basis. Awesome. That is great, great advice. Thank you again so much for joining us, for being an incredibly inspirational leader and for making us all healthier. No, thank you. Absolutely pleasure talking to you, Lauren. I know we've sat in a lot of settings before talking about talent and data, but this was very different conversation that we had today. And I'm very thankful for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you today. Now, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Same here. Truth Be Known is brought to you by Talent, a leader in data integration and data integrity Talent enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talent Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete, clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talent.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com.